What's going on, everybody? My name is Danny, a.k.a. Captain Sin. This is Chatting with Captain, recorded live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash thecaptainsin. My guest today is good Charlotte guitarist Billy Martin. How's it going? What's up, man? How are you? I'm good. And Thank you for having me. Oh, of course, of course. Um, I always ask the same question to every musician that's on. Okay. What was the main album from your youth that inspired you to travel down your life path that still inspires you to this day? Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of records. It's hard to pinpoint, but like when I think about what's like the record for me, it was uh, Frog Stomp by Silverchair. Nice. That was definitely like the record because they were so young. You know, they were 15, 16 when they put that record out. And I was also young and just starting to play guitar. And I kind of think back then, you, you know, most bands were like 25 when they came out. Like that was kind of the norm. Bands were older. Nowadays, people come out so young. But, you know, when they put that record out at such a young age, it definitely kind of uh, kickstarted that in my brain that, hey, if they can do it at this age, maybe I can too. And, and so that definitely was like the record that made me be like, I want to like be in a band. Did you start with guitar? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I started with guitar, yeah. Uh, what, when, what, when, how old are you? Um, I think I was 15, maybe 14. I'm not quite oh, sure. Nice. Sometimes I'm around 14, 15. Nice. Uh, what, what, uh, what kind of guitar did you start with? My very first guitar was this one called the Terminator and it came from JC Penny. It had like a <laughs> built-in speaker, like in the guitar, you nice. put a nine volt battery in yeah. and it was just like an all in one. And then I got a, a PV guitar a few months after that. Nice. And I played that PV for years until I got my first PRS. Nice. Um, when did you start drawing and stuff? Because I know you've been you've done that for years, but did you always were you always an artist or? Yeah, that was first. I thought that was what I would do. I always thought either comics or animation would would be what I would do for a living. So since I was really really little, I mean, old enough to hold a pencil, I'd sit in front of the TV just watching cartoons and trying to just copy the cartoons off the TV. And uh, yeah, I always figured that's what I would do. And then I, you know, I just really I was always into music, but I wasn't, I didn't have any musicians in my family. There's, there was no like people around me playing instruments. I didn't really, I didn't grasp the idea that I could be a musician until older. You know, it was one of those things that just didn't hit me because I kind of thought, oh, you're, you know, you grow up with as a musician or it's in your DNA or something. And until I was a teenager and I realized like, okay, I could try to play guitar and picked up guitar and, then I just became obsessed and I was like, okay, I don't want to do art anymore. I just want to do music. Mm. Uh, and then you get on tour and there's like so much downtime, you know, you play <laughs> for one hour a night and the rest of it is just doing nothing. So I just kind of picked up art again as something to do to kill time. And then, you know, I just found a passion for both and just realized, okay, I got to find a way to make both of these into a career for myself. Right. When you first got the call from Marvel that they wanted you to do stuff, what was that like? Yeah, that was crazy. I mean, I'd been pushing for that for years. Obviously, I've been working in comics and doing a lot of independent, um, like sort of the smaller indie labels um, who, you know, who are nice and would, you know, let let me draw for them. Um, but I really, of course, wanted to get to Marvel. Like, who doesn't? I mean, that's the, the top of the food chain. And I would send Marvel stuff and they were like, oh, this is cool. You know, like your drawings are, are good, but not quite there. And I just kept thinking like, Okay, and a lot of my friends would be like, oh, you're in a band who has like a fan base. That's like a built in a, a guarantee for Marvel. You, Marvel, you're going to draw a book and they're going to sell some because like your fans are going to buy it. And I and I would always say to them like, yeah, okay, but like I have to draw as good as the best Marvel artists out there. Mm. So if I'm not on par with them, why would they hire me? And I always try to say like, would you take the guy in your neighborhood who's like really good at building cars to like come fix your plumbing because he started a plumbing business? Like, no, you wouldn't. He's he he's known for fixing cars, not for plumbing. Why? So why would you hire someone who's known as being a guitar player to draw a comic book? Like when there's already like a hundred other of like the best comic book artists out there. So, you know, I took a couple of years to just really focus on my skills and I was just like, get better, get better, get better. Like I got to get better. And, um, I had a friend of mine who runs this this comic this Comic Con thing called Ace Comic Con. They do a bunch mm. of them all over the world, and it's a really great show. And my friend Stephen, who runs it, wanted me to do uh, like an exclusive Marvel cover that you could only get at one of the shows. So you know, he kind of pitched them on it, and 
they were like, nah, we want to get like a, a, a different artist, like someone who's already like a known Marvel artist. Cause there's a lot of paperwork. You have to be like an mm-hmm. approved Marvel artist. You can't just like hop in and draw a book. Like you have to be on the tax, you know, the payroll and all that. It's a lot of work. And they were like, let's do something easier. And he was like, no, 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 it has to be Billy. Uh, and, and finally after him really pushing, they're like, okay, that's fine. He can do one cover. So I did one. And I think they were messing with me. They're like we're going to give you, two covers and they connect so you have to do like two covers it's mm-hmm. like a wraparound thing and it was like a big project for my first marvel cover ever that and you can get both collecting issues so you know i tried really hard of course i was on tour in europe at the time that Oof. i had to get it done <laughs> um but i always bring like i have like a digital tablet and that's how i do everything anyways so i, I worked on it and i sent it in and they were like hey this is actually really good. Do you want to do six more covers for us? Oh, and I nice. was like, you know, holy shit. And so that was really <laughs> it. You know, so I, I got to shout out my friend, Stephen Seamus for pushing. And, you know, once I got in the door, I had to show up. Nice. That's crazy. So, and I give long winded answers just, you know, it's, sorry, oh, it's all talking. good. I, that's perfect. <laughs> um, I can see in the back, you've got a few things. Are you into collecting like toys and all that stuff too? I mean, I used to be. I, I mean, that's like what I have left. I used to have like an entire basement. I mean, like <laughs> so much stuff. It was ridiculous. But now I have kids of my own and they have so much crap that like all the toys all over the place. I'm like, no, like I need a quiet, like clean place of my own. So <laughs> it's having kids made me stop collecting. But I kept like some of like the nice, the nicer high end collectibles or sort of mm. hard to find stuff. Um, but yeah, I got rid of like a lot of just the crap plastic, just action figure stuff. I've, I've got a lot built up i got really into the funkos the funko yeah. pops i've got i, mean, I think cool. like I 120 of them in there it's uh, like yeah that's a lot that's a shit that's a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's cool i still love that i mean i, st- I go i do a lot of comic con still like i set up a booth and um you know i go and i meet fans and i do like commissions and sell comics and all the stuff that i work on so i see all the collectors and um you know all the the toys and a lot of them like oh i should get this and Mm. my wife always comes with me is like do you really need that i'm like yeah you're right i don't need that (laughs) my voice of reason i was asking because of this i don't know if people remember these but you guys had your own figure sets how did that that come about that was prime toy collecting back. That's when I was super <laughs> into it. And um, yeah, I, I I knew all the guys who like made the toy companies and I had met with a couple different companies um, about making those toys. And just someone who I met at a Comic-Con was like, oh, I have a startup. The guy ended up being like the most shadiest, scammiest businessman oh, of man. all time. It was a really bad deal. We didn't make a single penny off those toys. Oh. It, was a, <laughs> it was a bad experience, really, really bad experience. I'm pretty sure... He got sued by like five other people right oh, after geez. that. Um, but either way, it was cool to have a toy. I still have like the actual molds, like the hard resin maquettes, like out oh, in my nice. garage. I just found them the other day when I was cleaning through stuff. Uh, but yeah, that was really cool. I mean, I was just obsessed with toy collecting and I kept being like, we got to make toys. We got to make toys and, you know, find someone who wanted to do it. Nice. That's cool that you have one though. Oh, I've got the whole set is in there, but like, oh, man. Yeah, See, I'm missing a Benji. I don't have Benji. I have the other four guys, but I gave him my actual Benji toy back in the day because he didn't have one. So I have like a incomplete set. Oh man, <laughs> I know. I know they did a they did a couple variants. I think yes, Hot, like Topic Hot Topic had Topic one. Variant. I think Spencer's had one. I think there was just and like a standard one. I, be- I believe was this big website back in the day, KillerToys.com. Right. So I remember Killer Toys got one. Hot Topic got one, and there was something else too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, those, <laughs> I was hunting those down back in the day. That was, those were not easy to come by at 14 years old. <laughs> when did you first get into Tim Burton stuff? Cause I know that's a big thing with you. Yeah, I love Tim Burton. I mean, I'm a huge Disney fan. I mean, mm. I love Disney. I've all, that, that was like it for me as a kid was copying Disney cartoons. I mean, Disney has always been like really important to me. Um, but I love, you know, I love Tim Burton because, you know, I also like, you know, people know that I love kind of goth and spooky mm, stuff. That's mm. also been like a big thing for me. But I'm much more into like, uh, I guess more like Halloween than horror, if that is, you know, like right, right, I right. love like whimsical kind of like monsters and bats and graveyards and like creepy trees and haunted houses, like a lot more than I'm into like slasher horror films or something like that like I, right, right. i'm more into like spooky than scary i guess if that's how you could mm. say it 
And nobody does that like Tim Burton because he just has such like a whimsical thing about it. Like there's always a little bit of fun to his movies, but there's also a darkness to it. But it's not like so heavy dark that it's uncomfortable. And and I just I just was always connected to that, that he's just so unique. I don't know anyone else who can do mm. something in the set within a second of seeing it. You're like, oh, that's Tim Burton. And if it's not, it's someone who's trying to be Tim Burton. Right. You know? Um, <laughs> So, yeah, that was big for me. And The Nightmare Before Christmas was just perfect because I've, I've been such an animation freak my whole life. I just love animation. And no one had really ever done like a spooky animation like that. And, and that one came out. It just really blew my mind. And, um, you know, I loved it when I saw it as a kid. But it wasn't until a few years later when I really started to get, you know, probably like around... 18, 19, when I started to get like a little more serious about my art and I started like really kind of studying like what what are the films that were really special to me what are the things that really hit me as a, as a kid and i started like researching and i don't think like at like 12 or 13 or 14 like are you looking at who's like directing who's art directing like i didn't pay attention to that stuff and i remember like looking back at like okay what are some of my favorite movies when i was a kid it was like nightmare before christmas edward scissorhands beetlejuice the first two batman movies and i was like wait a second all these things have something in common like these are all tim burton movies so Definitely once I like kind of clicked to me like, oh, like, OK, that's my thing. Like, I love Tim Burton. And then I just kind of went all in on like collecting what I could, making sure I had seen every single thing he had ever made and <laughs> reading the biographies and just uh, really diving in big on on Tim Burton, probably like around 18 or something like that. Yeah. Nice. Um, And that I feel like led into Danny Elfman as well. Of course, yes. I mean, obviously, you pick you one. One doesn't go without the other, and right. the soundtracks were a big part of my life too. Especially being a musician. I mean, you can really hear that on like the Chronicles of Life and Death mm-hmm. album for Good Charlotte. Obviously, like that was sort of. I learned how to play piano in between Young and Hopeless and Chronicles. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been really into um, just trying to learn piano and keys. I was really into Muse at the time. I, I loved that Muse. I thought always kind of had a very danny elfman-esque thing to them so i had been trying to learn how to play a bunch of danny elfman piano stuff and then yes when we went in to do the chronicles of life and death i mean you can hear it all over that record i was just super in my danny elfman phase and <laughs> trying to figure out how can you do danny elfman in pop punk you know right you've been doing a lot of uh producing of your own lately how's that been yeah i mean that's awesome that's really sort of my main focus right now um, you know, Good Charlotte, we're we're still a band and we, we took quite a long, you know, we took like about a four and a half year hiatus when everyone started having, you know, family and kids and didn't want to go on tour all the time. So, um, you know, we backed away from that for a little bit and then I kind of had an opportunity just to do whatever I want. So I really focused a little on the art a bit and then just on my own as a producer. And I wanted to do something really different. So I kind of just started making beats, doing a lot of like hip hop and electronic stuff. Mm-hmm just you know sometimes you do the same thing over and over again you need to 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 go left Mm. so i started just making a lot of beats and sending them out to people and you know a couple people started using the beats and um you know that led to to more and more things and then i started just uh i used a site called beat stars where you could just make instrumentals and you sell instrumentals on there and people can just you know go and find a beat they like and pick it up and use it and I had, it's funny because, you know, what with pop punk is, is getting so popular again. I mean, with guys like mm. MGK and, you know, Jaden and Kenny Hoopla and Youngblood and all these new artists um, doing pop punk, all the people who used to ask me for rap beats, now they're all like, can you make me pop punk? I'm like, really? <laughs> you want pop punk? And I was like, so you mean like, like trap beats with guitars? And they're like, no, like I want straight up like 2000s era pop punk rock tracks. I'm like, oh. So I thought no one else was really like making pop punk, like straight rock tracks and selling them on this beat star site. It was all rock, it was all rap stuff, you know, and mm. sure. There's a couple guys. I know I'm trying to say like I was the first one. Right, to do right. it, there's <laughs> other guys that are doing it, but there was a very small amount of people who were selling like pop punk and rock tracks. So that's what I just have been doing the last couple of months is just, just making straight pop punk and putting them up there. And I'm seeing more success with those beats than any of the rap beats. I mean, obviously mm. people, that's what they know me for. Like, right, right, right. Um, so that's one thing I'm doing, but I also have a couple albums that I did with a few artists that are going to come out later this year and early next year. One of them is just a straight pop punk record with this artist named Boy Band, nice. um, who's who's really great. We did a song together a couple years ago, his um, first single from his first record, and uh, we've been writing ever since. We got a whole collection of I think it's seven or eight just like straight pop punk rock tracks that we're going to put out later in the year, and it's it's a really good record, man. I'm 
so excited about that. And then I have a sort of a heavier project with the artist named Kid Bookie. Um, he's a British artist, kind of a rapper, singer, screamer all around. He works with uh, Corey from Slipknot a lot. They have a couple tracks together. Nice. And uh, he and I did like a straight like new metal record. I mean, it's funny. I mean, you see, I'm wearing a corn shirt. And yes, I come <laughs> from a pop punk band, but like that's not the music I grew up on. I still can't figure out how I ended up in a pop punk band because I'm like total new metal kid. Like that's where I started like sort of in my later teenage years playing guitar it was all about new metal so kind of cool that i got to make a pop punk record and a new metal record and, and both of those are going to come out really soon so I'm, I'm excited nice hell yeah that was it was that was kind of what happened when i started playing guitar it was you guys and then like a little bit right after that i found avenge sevenfold so i dove straight into like the metal core and then it just kind of took off from there but there's yeah. always been like that pop punk just the the guilty pleasure i guess you would say but i guess it's not a guilty pleasure anymore yeah 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 a lot of people think you just like have to like right like i mean i love rap music just as much as i love rock music i mean i think like listening to different types of music is a good thing oh yeah definitely especially inspiration wise it's through the roof um what do you what do you think it is about pop punk that's kept it around for all these years i mean it feels good. I think mm-hmm. like what you said, you know, like in a guilty pleasure way um, to the point where like, it's just like you put it on and it puts you in a good mood. I think that's right. the point of pop punk um, is it's not supposed to be like super technical. It's not supposed to be like super introspective. It's just like, you know, the lyrics are usually very honest. It's like very, you know, very sort of storytelling, honest lyrics with just you know simple music that makes you feel good and i kind of think that's the core of of me of pop music you know Mm. it's just a simple lyric that you can relate to and something that you can like hum along to and and pop punk is is kind of the only kind of rock that does that i mean sure like pop rock but that's kind of the same thing Mm -hmm. like it all kind of falls in the same but um you know pop and rock just go back to the Beatles, you know, it was like just simple chords and catchy melodies. And, you know, if they could have done it a little faster with distortion, like it kind of would have been pop punk, you know right. what I mean? It's just always been there. And um, I, I think, I don't think it's going to go away. I think it was one of those trends or genres that will find its way in different forms forever. Kind of like, like the eighties, the eighties has never gone away. Like, sure. Like it's not like cheesy, like the eighties was, but mm. you still hear like syncopated synths and you immediately think, Ooh, that's the eighties. Or you hear, um you know dueling har- harmony guitar solos like avenge or something like that and you mm-hmm. hear two guitars playing the same lick with a harmony and you immediately think 80s metal yes. you know like that's just just a sound and although that music doesn't sound like the 80s there's little things like that that will go and i think there's something about that sort of 2000s pop punk emo just sort of i don't know what it is whether it's like the sad truthful lyrics like the the like emotional lyrics like they're really opening up about something over music that just feels good like there's something about that like i had someone asked me this the other day like what it is what is it about pop punk and i'm like it's hard for me because i'm i don't think of myself <laughs> as a pop punker like i didn't grow up as a pop punker but i've literally since 2000 i have been surrounded and engulfed by pop punk my like for the last 20 years so i get it now like i studied it whether i wanted to or not like it's it's part of my life so mm. i do think that's kind of what what's kept it around is just that sort of like honest feel good aspect to it Right. And like, it's, it seems like most pop punk is about real life situations and a, like most people can relate to it. And I think that's the best part about it. Um, do you like to label music as far as genre wise, or is music just music to you? Cause I know there's a lot of people that hate genres with a passion. Yeah. I mean, yes and no. First of all, I want to shout out the chat. Cause I see a bunch of, you know, a bunch of people, oh, yeah, there's a bunch there. of people popping up. Yeah. Yeah. Chat, you know? A bunch of people, um, <laughs> Like Crystal BVB, she used to always come to my streams. Um, Black Jade, Lena, a um, bunch of people on here that um, I'm trying to scroll through. But um, yes, I used to, to use my Twitch a lot. And um, I apologize to all my Twitch fam. I just haven't for a while. A, a ton of the work I've been doing is just producing songs like these albums I was talking about. And I can't show that music on Twitch. So um, a ton of stuff. And then aside from that, I do a lot of work for Hasbro and Marvel where I design toys. So like most of my day has been designing toys, you know, for Marvel, which I can't show any of that stuff, or it's been <laughs> mixing and working on songs for artists. 
Um, it was cool at the beginning of the pandemic. I was just making beats, making beats, making beats all the time. And I could stream that stuff. And then like it picked up. And now like I'm actually not just making beats, but producing and writing songs for artists, which was the whole point of making beats mm. was so that I could show people what I could do so that I could start um, actually working with artists. So yes, lately all the stuff I've been doing, I can't stream. So I've totally fallen off on my Twitch. But I know there's a lot of people who are really supportive of me when I was just kind of starting making beats. So I see a bunch of them in the chat. So I just want to shout out, give some love. Thank you guys for still rocking with me. And I, I hope to get back to Twitch soon, but for now you come hang out with the captain and, and watch here instead. Yeah. I appreciate everybody being here. I do. It's, it's awesome. And then um, when you were on Twitch, were you gaming or was it more just music? No, I never did. I mean, I do play video games, but I'm never set up to like stream games. I, it was just, um, I would live stream just writing and making beats or sometimes I would do, art like you know someone would get a commission and i would draw it live on the stream so oh, nice. it's either just art art or music yeah what games are you into right now i still just play call of duty like every day <laughs> um, i try to play other stuff i couldn't get into fortnite couldn't get into apex uh, i don't even really yeah. like warzone because i can't wait that long to come back in i like just like the regular call of duty because when i die like i want to come right back in i can't stand the waiting so right um I've, but yeah, I, still, I mean, I play Call of Duty every day. <laughs> <laughs> I've recently oh. got back into Fortnite after years. I only played it a little bit, but here lately, okay. I really got back into Fortnite. I played a little bit of Apex. It's uh, it's gotten bad lately, like super sweaty, like awful. But um, are you playing Modern Warfare or are you playing Cold War? No, I've been playing Cold War. I... I kind of got into Cold War, but it was like, I, I think I was just sucked into Warzone so much from streaming it all the time that I just kind of yeah. like, I was just into it. Are you, Did you uh, check out any of the new gameplay for Vanguard yet? No, like when does it actually come out? Uh, oh gosh, I'm thinking November, like early yeah, November. Like I, I think that's about usually it when it hits. Out. Right. Yeah. I was thinking like, I know I'll get it, so I don't really need to see anything because I'm... <laughs> I played this one so much that I'm just like, oh, I need something new to play so bad. I think um, I think the worst, I think I got burnt out on Cold War. That was the issue because I jumped into yeah. it like hard, hard every day, six to eight hours a day. Like I got. Okay. I never play that much. But. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was streaming the whole time and I was stuck in the house. So I was just like, I'm just yeah. going to yeah, yeah, focus no, sure. on it. Uh, I got my snipers to diamond and I was like, man, I got to do something different. It's just like, yeah. <laughs> Were you, have yeah, you no, always I, been into video games? Yeah, I've always been like super into video games. Yes. I mean, like I had my, my clothing line level 27 back in the day was mm -hmm. like just a shout out to video games. I was right. like 27. That was always my lucky number. I was like, what could I put with it? And I was like, just level 27. Cause I love video games and stuff like that. So yeah, I'll, always been a, always been a big gamer. What was your game back in the day? Like when you were younger? Let's see. I loved Kingdom Hearts a lot. That was really Ooh, big. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Kingdom Hearts was good. I always loved the Zelda games too. Um, love Zelda. I mean, I've been on Call of Duty since Call of Duty 2. I played Call mm. of Duty. I didn't play the first, but from Call of Duty 2 all the way on, I really loved Gears of War. I was super into oh, Gears yeah. of War. Those were back in my, like, you know, when I was like 20 and didn't have kids and I would stay up till four in the morning every <laughs> night playing video games. It was definitely Call of Duty 2, Call of Duty 3, and Gears of War. Like those couple of games, that was definitely my biggest just like, all the time online playing games i got deep in well i mean i was young at the time i got deep into pokemon and stuff like that and those kind of games and then two kids so i'm very aware of pokemon, <laughs> My kids love pokemon. um i can't i think i started in world at war with call of duty and that okay. was when all of everybody when everybody wanted to play zombies all the time so yeah. that was a huge thing at that point in time. I think my personal first Call of Duty would have been Modern Warfare 2 because I didn't have the console at the time. But okay. when Modern Warfare 2 came out, that was it. I was dove headfirst into it, 100%. Yeah, it's funny because I had missed a couple. Like, I think I played 2 and 3 really hard. Mm -hmm. 4, they kind of lost me a little bit. And then I think maybe, I don't know if Modern Warfare 2 was 5 maybe or something like that. Well, there was, yeah, Call of Duty 4 one. was Modern Warfare. Okay, and then okay. I think World at War came after that. Because I like backed out for a little bit and I tried coming back to Call of Duty and there were so many more buttons. <laughs> than there used to be. And I was like, oh, but I don't know. Then I was thinking, did I get old? But, you know, now it's just about playing all the time. Because now, like, I play Call of Duty and literally, like, my hands are just like doing, I don't even think about it. They're just, yep. they just figure it out. It like, becomes okay, second nature. Here. Yep. <laughs> well, that was, it, that yeah. was the worst part about switching to mouse and keyboard is like, I was a controller player yeah. my whole life oh, and then switching to mouse and keyboard was just, it was 
it's so crazy. But now that I've now that I've switched, I can't go back. I've After tried to go back, and it's like I'm, I just I'm can't do it. Guy. But I can't freaking find a new Xbox. I still have the Xbox One, and I want the Series X so bad, mm, but it's so hard to get. Right, it. right, right. It's yeah. So hard. But yeah, no, I still still love live on my uh my Xbox. But I I keep thinking like, what can I do? I played Call of Duty so much. What's left, you know? But I had a uh, like my top. I got fifty four kills the other day in a round, and I felt really good because oh, nice. that was like my new that was my new top. Sure, there was a lot of deaths to go along with it, but more <laughs> kills than deaths. So I was very proud of I got 50 the other day and I was so pumped. And then just like three days later, I got 54 and I'm like, okay, let's keep going. And then the skill based matchmaking kicks in. And then exactly oof. right now, like I said, putting me in with the real guys <laughs> because I'm definitely like, I can't like sit back and wait. Like, I'm just like, go, go. The whole time I'm calling oh, yeah. duty, I'm like holding the stick down and I'm going fast. And I go, I use like the Groza mm. with like a thermal on it. So I'm just like, just like everywhere, just, just like running you know, through going. everybody. <laughs> and I get a lot of deaths that way because I can't just like sit back and wait or like sniper guys. Like I don't, my sniper is like so weak. I don't even snipe that often. I'm way too impatient to wait. <laughs> I, I used to be really deep. I think it was, I think it was Ghost, Call of Duty Ghost when that came out. Um, I that. It was decent. Like a lot of people hated it. I liked it. Um, we were tr- going to try out for the Call of Duty League. Like I was in the top 5,000 in the world in domination, nice. but like, I don't ever want to devote that much time to call of duty ever again. <laughs> that was just yeah, no, to get to that point to, was, like, yeah. You got to put some time in to make it real. So would you say first person shooters are at the top for you or they are now they didn't used to be, you know, like I used to much be more into like fantasy, like exploring adventure kind of games and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But I think like I'm very competitive in nature. Like I hate to lose. I like, (laughs) I like to win. So like, I like going online and like trying to play against like a bunch of 12 year olds and be like, Hey, you know what? I'm 40 and you're 12 and I still got first place. You know, like that makes me feel good. So yes, I I like, I guess because back when I was younger, you didn't go online and play. No. (laughs) And now that you go online and play, um, I'm much more into the first person shooter. Yeah. I can like golden eye. 007 on oh, yeah. N64. Those were the first. Was, yeah, that yeah. was oof. That was one of the few. I like that one. What was the other one? We used to play this one on the bus, all the time splitters. You know, time splitters. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we yeah. used to play time splitters on the bus a lot back in the day. Yeah. Man, those were the days. <laughs> you okay. try to go back and play those first person shooters from back in the day now, it feels so clunky because it's just oh, like yeah. everything's so advanced now when you go back it's like you try to move like you do now and it just goes all the way across the screen you're like oh god i can't do it yeah anymore. i wouldn't even try <laughs> um as far as like video games go uh would you say you're just xbox or did no, you d- did you dive into right no i have a playstation also but my place PlayStation, the playstation hard drive like corrupted a couple Ooh. of months ago i opened it up and i just got this message that was like can't open the hard drive something and if you want to use this go to playstation.com and plug in an external and then download something and pretty much i guess you have to wipe it and that just pissed me off so i haven't turned it on again <laughs> since then i'd been playing miles morales and i was super into it and i was probably at like 90 percent on the game and i was saving the, the last boss because i wanted to get as many other like you know little hmm tasks so i could try to get to 100 percent, and then that happened before i could beat the boss and oh, i was man. like oh i'd have to start all over oh. so yeah i was like i'm not <laughs> even gonna install this so i was like i'll just get ps5 but joke's on me that's not <laughs> happening either i bought a ps4 just to play the original spider-man oh yeah those games that, are so that was good. so good and then i didn't touch the playstation after that because i had to three i had the xbox one so that yeah. was my main console but i was like i have yeah, to buy a playstation really just to play spider-man that game was so good like I'm with you it's so fun i mean that's why like soon as that miles came out i was like okay i'm, I'm like the day it came out i downloaded it 100 percent. Um, it was so good as far as playing music on twitch goes did you ever get any like hassle from twitch about dmca stuff no because i was always writing original stuff on right, the spot right. it wasn't anything that was copywritten or um at one point I did like a, a playthrough when it was the 20 year anniversary of our self-titled record. Mm-hmm. I did a playthrough. Um, but like I'd actually was in touch with the people at Twitch ahead of time. And like, I told them that I was going to do it and they, you know, 
they featured it for me and they knew about it. And then, you know, I posted it on YouTube also, and I did get one on YouTube and I just wrote them just kind of saying, well, it's my band yeah. actually. And they were like, okay, all good. So that's the only time I've ever had that kind of an issue. Well, that's a plus. Um, Cause I know it's a thing for sure. You know, oh, it's... Um, I, I mean, I wish I, it wasn't right, but it is, I can understand why to an Same. extent, but it's like, man, if a kid's just sitting there playing a game and he's got music on in the background, I, I, I don't feel like the artist is losing well, out on him. Why that streams, you know? Yeah, that's a be another source of revenue. Like if YouTube st- stream plays, like why can't Twitch also just be if the like, song gets played, even if it's in the background? Exactly. Um, it's owned by yeah, Amazon too, so it's not like they don't have right. the money to link into it. I guess it's just a I don't know. Who knows? It's, yeah. I hate that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of it's yeah. Ugh. Um. Why do you think streaming, well, other than the pandemic, that was a, I know that was a huge thing, but like streaming in general has exploded over the past, I guess, two or three, maybe four years. Why do you think that is? I wish I knew the answer to that, you know, cause you know, like I said, I have, I have two sons who are nine and 12, you know, hmm. so, um, that, you know, they're very into that. Like at there's points where they would rather watch people play video games on TV than watch a movie or a show or anything. And, you know, people who are my age, it's like hard to understand. They're like, why would you want to watch someone play more than <laughs> actually play it or like watch a show or something? And they just love it. I think part of it is the community. Like people like to like hang out in the chat and like see the people, you know, like it's similar to like an AOL chat room back in the nineties. Like, oh, you know, yeah. there would be a chat room about your favorite band and you would all hop in and talk about your favorite band. Cause maybe there was like two people at school who knew your favorite band cause it was obscure. But when the whole world is like your option on the internet, you're going to find hundreds of people who mm. like that. And it's almost just like the internet helps you find your people. You know, you find right. your people who you connect with and you love this certain game. And that's all you think about is this game. And you want to find other people who love that game. And you go to school and people are like, shut up nerd. No one likes that game. And you're like, okay, but you go to like a stream where they're playing the game and everybody there loves that game right. and people are very accepting of it. And I think it's, it's, you know, like we live in a digital world, which is weird. Mm. It's like, yeah, like going to a concert is cool and in, in, in meeting other people and like finding people who like your band, but not everybody can go to the concert. Like if one person lives in Indonesia and one person lives in Australia and the other person lives in America and they all love the same thing, like they could go to a stream or, or something like that and mm. all be there talking and hanging out. So, I think it connects people and video games are really popular. That is a common denominator that a lot of people share. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the streaming is the community. And I would come to find that too. Like when I would be streaming, like, Oh, I'm going to go stream myself making beats. And like all these like young artists are going to come check it out who are looking for beats and they're going to watch me making the beat and be like, yo, this beats crazy. I want to buy it, you know, and I'd stream and all I would have on there was good Charlotte fans, you know, and at first, you know, no offense to anyone listening. This is my <laughs> honesty. I was disappointed because I thought I'm out here making music. I'm going to have other producers asking me like, yo, what compressor are you using or what sound? Or like, right. where'd you get that drum sound from? Or like talking technical talk and stuff like that. And that's what I figured. And it was just like, hey, I saw Good Charlotte, you know, when I was in high school and you guys are my favorite band. And I'd, you know, and I'd be like, that's not what I thought I was doing. But then when I like realized, well, wait a second, like all like it's a whole bunch of people who love my band and they want to come and hang out and like remember Good Charlotte moments. And like, this is just a community. And I started realizing, OK, so I'm building my own little like Twitch community of like I'd see the same like 10 people would be there first right when the stream starts and like you realize like, okay, this is like my little Twitch family. And like, this, <laughs> this is, this is w- what, what they like to do. They want to hang out in here and just kind of talk music with me. And, and like, once I realized what it was and what it could be, it was so much more fun. Like I would come on and just be like, yo, what's up guys, let's make music. I wouldn't talk about all the technical stuff I was doing. And sometimes I would not even talk. I would continue to make the music and make the beats because I wanted to have beats to put on my store and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But really I would just kind of like, look at what the chat was talking about and kind of like keep the conversation going and see what they wanted to talk about and just, you know, kind of engage your fan base and, and make it a place that was exciting and that they wanted to come hang out with. And right. yeah, it, it definitely, once I clicked with the realization, like, Oh, that's what streaming is. It's not, yo, check out how cool I am. It's like, <laughs> yo, let's come hang out in the spot together and like our comfortable place where people have like a similar thing that they're into. And, and that's really what, it, what, what I think it's, is why, the whole streaming thing is popular. Right. That's, 
that's mainly why I've done it lately. It's just, it's a place to connect with people. And like streaming for me personally has gotten me all the connections that I've got right now. Like it started, I started streaming in like a month and a half. I would say later I met Bobby from Blackcraft and started nice. working with him on his Twitch as a mod. Nice. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. Shout out to Bobby. I, d I did like a cool black craft like shirt design before and he's right. always been super cool to me. So he's a good dude. He helped a ton with that's everything awesome. that's happened. And then that, I mean, that led to the podcast because he started a podcast and then I was just sitting there one day like, hey, I'd like to start a podcast too. And then I was, he's like, hey, do you want to do it? He's like, cool. And then that led to Wes coming on and that has exploded. Like I'd never thought in a million years that would explode as much as it has, but I put that on YouTube and it's sitting at almost 10,000 views, which is just nuts. Awesome. Well, that's how you sold me, you know? Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, if, if everyone's like, what one guitar player was the most influential to you as a guitarist, I would always say Wes, no question. That's like the number one guitar player. I mean, you know, not that you asked, but, you know, dive into Wes. <laughs> it's all good. Go right ahead. <laughs> I mean, I've had like a, like one time we were doing an interview in Japan and the interview over there was like, and I didn't even say anything. He was like, you know, I really love this new record. And it's funny when I listen to Good Charlotte, I would think that, you know, you have more in common with guys like Wes Borland or Head Monkey from Corn than you do with Tom DeLonge or something mm -hmm. like that. And I was like, wow, this is like the first interview who was like picked up on that before. And I was like, yes, you know, that's right. And I felt like, like I, I always felt like a slight relation to Wes in that, I was like in a pop punk band, but like I wasn't a pop punker. So like people are always like when Good Charlotte was doing really well, they would like question our punkness all the time in interviews because, oh, you know, interviewers are jerks, you know, and they would kind of be like, so next question, top five albums that came out in 1986 on this label that did like try to like really test our punkness. And I would always be like, oh, I'm going to fail really bad because I don't know any of this. And they're like, poser, fake, you know, you're not punk. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not punk. I'm so not punk. I've right. never been punk. I'm not into being punk. So that's really when I kind of started pushing, like, the whole, like, goth thing because I felt like I needed to, like, stick, stick out. Like, I didn't want to look like I was in Blink. You know, I didn't right. want to have, like, yellow baseball cap and like bright like you know mm -hmm. dickies and stuff like that even though i felt like i was supposed to dress like that because that was the look i was like no you know i'm gonna like wear all black i'm gonna wear eyeliner i'm gonna have like just like do my whole like goth new metal thing but like in a pop punk band mm. purely because i was it was like me revolting or like resisting against what people thought i was supposed to be and i felt like that with wes you know wes was in this like rap rock new metal band where fred like looked like a rapper with his baseball cap and everything and wes was probably like oh that is so not my thing but this is my band so he's like i'm gonna put like crazy costumes on and like just really like go against what everyone thinks i'm supposed to look like in a band like this mm. and i always thought like i love that about wes and and i just sort of connected on that level and just like his style of playing to uh just always really appealed to me. So yeah, um, I, I love Wes. I think he's, he's so cool. Uh, he actually, I wish I would have grabbed it. I completely forgot. It's still up in the old office. Um, I have one of his vinyls that it opens up and there is, he drew a picture inside of it. Nice. And I'm like, man, that's just, it's and yeah, he's crazy to too. have. Another, yeah. He's like such a good there, artist. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. he said he went to art school when he was younger. So like I, it makes sense because he does most of their art, I believe. Yeah, the very first time I saw Limp Biscuit play was um on on Three Dollar Bill, y'all. Um, where before any songs were on there, like there was only maybe forty people at the show at the very oh, most. Wow. It was at this little bar in Maryland. Cold was opening, which was really cool. Oh, nice. Um, and Wes still had long hair at the time, and he had these like black jeans on, and he had painted clown faces all over the the pants. So they were like. He just comes out on stage with like long hair and like no shirt and just like black jeans with like clowns painted all over them. And uh, it was just so weird and I, so cool at the same time. So, yes, you know, West Wes has always, you know, inspired me on many levels. And just, I guess, maybe three or four years ago, we did um, a couple of festivals down in Australia and Limp Bizkit and Corn were both on on the festival. Oh, nice. so, I mean, I was just like, you know, drooling <laughs> like 15 year old me was like, I'm playing with Limp Bizkit and Corn. And I totally get, you know, me and Wes got to hang for a little bit and I told him all these stories too, you know, and he was <laughs> super nice and super cool about it. 
it's always weird when you meet your heroes because you never know like are they going to be cool are they going to like totally ruin everything for you and both both the corn guys and the biscuit guys were like super nice to me well that's that's basically like this podcast like i've been able to talk with these guys that i've like i had their posters on my walls growing up and it's just like just having a normal conversation with them it's just nuts it, absolutely blows my mind because it's like i'm just some dude from ohio who's just kind of sitting in a room but it's like people tend to forget that people in bands are just normal people too i think and it's just like most of us like to talk you know yeah it's just like talk about our music that's the only thing i do want to talk about so someone's like you want to come talk about the stuff that you love i'm like yeah sure why not exactly and what about movie wise like that's a big thing um are you into like what genre do you think is like your favorite? Um, let's see. Like, I mean, I like science fiction and fantasy, and I mean, I'm big into animation. I mean, I still right, right. love animation. That's like my first real love. So, I'll watch every animated feature that comes out, even mm. if it's not that good. Like, I try to just study. Um, mm. a little shout out. I worked on a movie earlier this year that's going to come out not till 2023 which is crazy but it's a movie called sneaks um and it's like a cg animated feature that i got to work on as the character designer for a few months earlier this year so i can't really talk too much about it obviously but right um you know that's something that i'm really excited about and so so i love animation i'm just a student of it i love studying it i used to be really into horror like i would watch like every scary movie that came out but i feel like they've just been remaking the same scary movie for 10 years now Mm -hmm. i haven't seen one that like really really you know, I guess like Get Out or something was cool. That was different. Um, but that was more like suspense than horror, I guess. Right, um, right, right. When there's been a couple good ones, but yeah, I love. I mean, I love the Marvel stuff. I mean, obviously, like oh. you know, I draw Marvel stuff all day long. So like for me, that's just research. Uh, we went and saw um, Shang Chi just this weekend, and I thought that was really cool. I haven't gotten to see that yet. I've actually I haven't seen Black Widow yet either. It's been uh, yeah. So I I got both of those out of the way. Yes. <laughs> I know they're gonna get spoiled if I don't see them. But the other cool and not cool thing is is a lot of times like I'm I've done a lot of toy designs for these, but I did them last year mm. because that's how much earlier you have to to do it. So you know I'll have to sign an NDA that says you're not allowed to talk about this, and I'll see all the costumes and the stuff from the movies before they come out because nice. I'm I've been doing toy designs. So a little bit gets spoiled, like oh I already know that, um I already know this, I already <laughs> know that, and um like they were um. I mean, it's it's not a big spoiler, but they were having me do Taskmaster stuff all the time. All these Taskmaster toys. I was thinking, who knew Taskmaster? That's such a random character. Nobody's like, that's not a big character. And then, of course, Black Widow comes out, and that's like a big right. part of Black Widow. And I was like, oh, and then it clicked. Like, that's why I was doing all these things a year ago. They didn't tell me <laughs> why I was doing Taskmaster. They were just like, here's the toys we need you to work on. <laughs> um, and then it's funny when it clicks. And I'm like, ah, so now whenever they start sending me stuff, I start thinking, okay, why am I drawing this character? That means something's <laughs> coming up. Get to <laughs> conspiracy theorize with yourself. Exactly, with myself. <laughs> um, I 100% agree that horror movies have just been repetitive for the past whatever. It seems like they found uh, like The Conjuring, like that paranormal jump scare style of movie, and they ran it straight into the ground as hard as they could because they knew people were going to pay for it. Yeah. I... I don't know. I my favorite horror movies are the Universal monster movies from the 30s. Uh, I'm with like you there, a thousand dude, percent. Sure. Like I love that stuff too. I mean, I I like monster movies. You know, like right. I'm, if I'm gonna see something scary, like I don't want to see something that like I could possibly see. I want to see something that I couldn't see without hmm. it being a movie. Right. I'm I'm also a big fan of just practical effects, and those movies were all practical effects for the most part. Yeah. Because it's like. I feel like there's kind of a disconnect when you can tell something CG and you're just like, eh, well, you know, like I know that was made on a computer, but I think that was what was best about those movies back then because it was the, it was the makeup for part of it, but the actor really had to do a good job back then for those movies to actually work. So sure. it was yeah. just, they're timeless. It's just, that's how it is. And a lot of people are like, oh, I wouldn't watch that. It's black and white. And it's like, no, you got you got to go back and watch them. They're so good. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I have like a, a couple box sets of all those original um, DVDs back when we used to buy DVDs. Now that's another thing that takes up space because you can just watch them online. But yes, I love like the whole classic universal horror stuff. It's awesome. And then they tried to reboot it and it just, 
That's another they thing. One, right? They did one, and they're like, we're going to reboot them all, and they did, like, Invisible Man, and then that's it, right? Well, they did um, Dracula Untold, which was supposed to be... That? That, was, that was supposed to start it off, and then they okay, killed that it. Was, that one was not good, yeah. And then they did The Mummy with Tom Cruise, and that was supposed to kick it off. And then it, it f- just went downhill, so they killed it at that as well. And then they brought The Invisible Man out for a third one, because they've tried to reboot it that, over the yeah, years. That one did okay. So then they were like, right, and then like, no, this was meant to be the first one. Right? <laughs> I didn't mind uh, the mummy with Tom Cruise in it. I didn't think it was like all I that thought, bad. Like, as soon as I see Tom Cruise, I'm like, Oof, I don't know if I'm going to watch this. So I may have missed that one on purpose. It wasn't bad. I actually, right. in, I enjoyed it for the most part. I'll have to go back and check that one out there. The Chucky movies. Yeah. Somebody said Chucky and Pet Cemetery in the chat. The Pet Cemetery remake was decent, but I, I'm still into the. Yeah, the, I saw that one too. It was okay. The Chucky movies I've always been into because, like, it's just it's a guilty pleasure, yeah. I guess. And now they have My the TV series coming out. So bad. Yeah, that, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. If, the, if the if the TV series is going to be safer or is it like the same level of? Apparently, it's the same level. They're okay, they're bad because my twelve year old wants to see it so bad. <laughs> Probably not yet. Like he he saw Stranger Things and now like he's all set up on like what else can I watch that's spooky like this? And I'm like <laughs> oh, almost everything else is not appropriate. Like Stranger Things did such a great job at oh, yeah. making it like really good, and every like parents, kids, every age group can like can love that. Uh, as far as I guess that's horror. As far as horror, mm. I guess kind of, you know, that's probably like the best thing that's come out in a long time. Oh, a hundred percent. I really love Stranger I, Things. Oh yeah. I got deep into that. And I think that helped with the whole like synth wave, retro wave, sure. just yep. massive. Oh, yeah. I mean, I downloaded the soundtrack immediately. Those guys are awesome. A hundred percent. Um, I got deep into synth wave and all that stuff in the past like year and a half, two years. Nice. Uh, I was actually going to say earlier, because you were talking about Korn, um, their keyboard player, Davey, has a synthwave oh, yeah, band. Davey, yeah. Or retrowave, I should say. It's, there's so many different genres of that. It's I mean, like... <laughs> I got a shout out to Davey. He, he, whether he knows it or not, it was like a like pivotal point in like a lot of things that have been happening for me, mm-hmm. production We haven't talked for quite a long time. So we met. At that when when I met Corn and Limp Bizkit a few years ago with the store we were just talking about down in Australia, um, he was down there, you know, because he plays keys for Corn, and we had never met before and just had a couple of mutual friends and we started talking and um, he, he I was telling him yeah I'm, I'm you know I've been getting into producing and making beats and I'm really into keys and he was like oh you know we should talk more and he connected me with a friend of his um, named Morgoth Beats another producer um, they knew each other. And he put me in touch with Morgoth and the two of us did a couple beats and it got on Little Zan's record. So that was like the first like placement I got on an actual mm-hmm. album. So, you know, because of that conversation with Davey, it led to me introducing to someone who got me on a record. And up until that point, I was just making beats by myself. And once I actually got it on a record, that really like started the fire and like, ooh, I think I can do this producing thing. So yeah, D- Davey, he's a cool dude. And he draws too, you know, we kind of have that in, oh, nice. in common. That he, he's that. an artist and he makes music, but... Yeah, you know, shout out, shout out to him. Um, what do you think it is about the '80s that has kept it like the '80s style, like that music and that art style, that has kept it fresh? I guess really. You know, like I always think of the '80s as like the first era where like things were like like bright and big and cool mm-hmm. and new or something like that. Right, right. You know, like. 60s you know and 70s that was a lot of just sort of i don't know i think like hippies disco like still kind of like it wasn't like bright neon lights and like on tv and commercials and commercial like like just very like modern commercial success was the 80s the 80s launched right. like mm-hmm. bigness in the entertainment i don't know what the word yeah, I'm right <laughs> like the 80s is when things got like big and i think there's something about that feeling that's continued on through the years like when you hear that sound or something it immediately thinks just like techie and cool like futuristic because like at the time the 80s were very futurist although now it feels retro but like just that sound of just do 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 like arpeggiators and stuff like that as soon as you hear that sound you immediately think like Ooh, sci-fi, computer tech. Right, so right. like it just makes you think of that. And so yeah, that sound, there's like a modernized version of that sound. But in general, yes, I do think that like just 
80s music in general is what is just like mixed with like future like you think right. 80s feels like the future right um it's like uh i don't know if i don't know if it's the fact that nothing new has come out that has really like really revolutionized i guess and that's why people are still going back to those old sounds or if it's just the fact that if it's not broke don't fix it yeah both I and mean, as far as electronic goes music goes i do think that like the whole dubstep thing when that happened like kind of revolutionized right, right. electronic music again mm. um you know i think you look there was the 80s and then the 90s you had stuff like chemical brothers moby like daft punk like stuff like that 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 was like the next wave of like okay it's electronic music without vocals but it's on the radio and it's big right and then i think then it was just like raves forever like house music raves <laughs> dance music it was kind of the same and mm. then i think when dubstep happened in the late 2000s it like well i guess you already had guys like you know diplo and right 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 um, dead mouse and stuff like that like sort of you know making electronic music big again but i don't know i think you know every 10 years or so there's like something that comes mm -hmm. and and then when there isn't something new you like default back to what's good and like the 80s keyboard sound is like something you can always default back to when there isn't like a moment or something happening that's always going to be like oh yeah this this still works and like this is still good because i think if you made a 90 sounding like house track it would feel very dated right now. Right, right, 100%. But if you do an 80s something, for some reason, it, it doesn't, you know? Which right. Which is just weird. It's crazy, yeah. And then I guess the same with pop punk now. It seems like it, you would think that it would be kind of a dated thing, but it's not. It's like, I guess, fresher now than it's been in a really, really long time. And, and it's I think not even like a change of sound. It sounds no. the same as it did in 2000. It's like th there's not even like new production techniques. It's the same. Right. And I think that's like all of these people who are doing it now were like me, like kids when all of it came out and they just want to do what they were listening to when they were kids. And I think that's part of the reason why it's so big now is because it was like ingrained into everybody when they were in their teens. I think, you know, and I think a big part of it is like accessibility um as far as like uh equipment wise and stuff like that like i really think that whole sound from maybe five or six years ago with guys like little peep and juice world and stuff like that was like it's like they wanted to make pop maybe not those guys specifically but all the sort of like emo soundcloud like mm -hmm. scene that was happening it's like they wanted to make pop punk but it's really expensive to get in the studio and like record live drums and like do record a band is expensive so mm. they were like but i could plug my laptop in and i could plug my guitar into it and i could play some pop punk guitar chords and i can sing into my laptop and then i could just make the beat i can make the drums like in mm. fl studio or something and then that's my song you know like i feel like an entire generation of music came out of that purely because that's all like all these kids had laptops right. but they didn't have 10 grand to go in the studio so oh, like the whole yep the whole sound was i want to make pop punk but i've got to do it with rap drums because that's what i have accessibility to and um i think now like it's just people are like okay i've been doing this for five years like i'm tired of it like i actually want to make pop punk now and i think that's sort of where why it's coming back is is people tried it they experimented with this sort of emo sound and it was cool but like it just wasn't enough and now like yet again like when i write stuff like there's a couple programs out there that when i do my drums in them like people ask me all the time like i can't tell is this a real drummer or have you programmed it i'm like yeah it's gotten that good now mm. that you can program drums that like literally sound like a drummer's playing them and that also makes it where these kids can be like okay like i don't have to do rap beats anymore i can straight up make pop punk like i imagined right. it and then i think that's just a natural evolution of where the sound was going and where we're at right now um as far as like digital, I guess digital instruments, I, I would be the easiest way to describe it. Um, as far as guitar tones go, are you more into like straight amp or has the digital kind of like swayed you in that direction? Because I know there's a lot of guitar players that are straight up. If it's not an actual amplifier, I won't play it. But then there's like people who are getting into like the Kempers and the Axe effects and stuff like that and just fully devoted to that. Which side of that are you on? 
I'm right down the middle because when I'm at home in the studio, it's like I haven't turned an amp on for years. I plug it right into my interface and everything is digital when mm. I'm tracking. But on tour, I still want a real amp. Like I know right. some guys don't even bring amps, you know, it's just like, um, like literally just a guitar plugged into a DI, you know, yep. but no, I, I like, in fact, I have a fairly like extensive setup for live. I'll have like, I use like an orange rocker verb for my distortion channel. And then I use a Fender Twin for my clean channel. And then I have like an AB box. So mm. depending on what I'm going from distortion to clean, I'm switching between amps. And then um, I used to have a crazy pedal board, but I have gone down to like the simulated digital pedal board where all the effects are just, it's just so much easier to travel, travel like that. Um, but yeah, so I get both. I think that a real amp is always going to sound like a real amp. And there's mm -hmm. something like a power that like when I'm on stage, I want to feel the power of the amp. Like right, when your right. amps cracked really loud and you stand in front of it, like you can feel it, you know, right, you right. can. Um, but in the studio when like my wife's trying to watch TV, my kids upstairs playing video games, like, yeah, I need to turn it down, but I need <laughs> to get that really big sound. So like you can crank your digital amp up and turn your speakers down and you're still going to get the effect of a really loud amp without right. actually blowing everyone out of the water. So I think convenience wise, and the tones are so good. Like there's oh, yeah. so many digital tones that I get where I'm just like, man, this sounds so good. I can't believe it's not a real amp. So and I love both. And that's I get both. a really good thing about it is like people who use a lot of different tones on albums can finally hit all of those tones live now just that with a too, push should. of a button yep. and if instantly. you want to bring the exact album to the stage you can do that now right yes that that's another thing that that's kind of one of the arguments is that okay well if i wanted to just listen to the album i'd go put the album on i go to a live show because i want to hear a live show but i think that's kind of the argument from some people about why people should I'm just use amplifiers right so i'm with choice b on that like you can listen to the album all you want go you should go to the show you should have a different experience than you should right when listening to the album 100 percent. um yes. chat if you guys have any questions i know i've seen a bunch of stuff pop up yeah i keep trying to look back and yeah, forth. it's like <laughs> um yeah if What's anybody it? has the first song you learned to play on guitar the first song i learned was come as you are by nirvana for sure that was my my first song pretty classic easy guitar lick what else am I missing? Da, 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 da. Let me go up to the top here. A lot of people talking about how they were into good Charlotte when they were teenagers, which same. <laughs> Told you that. So that that's the classic chat, but that's okay. Hey, it's all good. Like Appreciate I it. I remember though I've actually only been able to see you guys once, but it was crazy because it's like a lot of shows don't really stick I feel like we like lived in ohio on tour <laughs> <laughs> um always there where do you live in ohio what like what part i live uh towards the indiana border but when okay. i uh when i saw you guys it was in columbus with simple plan and reliant k okay and then the, the the crazy part of it it was like an open air thing there was no roof it's outside yeah uh, it's it sticks with me so well because the stage setup at the time was like the gargoyles on the stage and like the fencing yes. and all of that. Wrong and, moment for me. Something <laughs> designed, designed all those and somebody built them. That was really cool. I loved that set. What had happened the whole day, it was sunny and hot and like all of that. Right before you guys came out, they rolled the gargoyles out, started the fog and everything. The sky turns black. It starts pouring rain and lightning starts shooting across the sky. The lights shut off, the intro track to chronicles starts and i'm just like jesus it's like everything just fit perfectly into that day that's crazy so did we get to keep playing or did they stop oh it, no, it went through the whole thing yeah okay okay probably shouldn't have, if they're <laughs> playing, should have but, you know you got to trust that somebody else is going to shut the show down if it's not safe you got to focus on playing but hey that's cool man that's that's you know we actually brought a like a harp weather machine and we changed the sky in every city it was actually <laughs> just to make it dark. rain <laughs> yeah like that was part of it yeah Will Good Charlotte ever unite again? I mean, I don't I mean, think Good Charlotte ever together. broke up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're still, we put a new song out in December, actually. Just last year, we put one new song out. Um, just because, yes, it had been forever. And it was cool. For the first time ever, we all recorded our parts at home hmm. and, like, sent them in to the engineer. And, you know, he kind of mixed everything together. So because that was kind of like height of the pandemic. We couldn't get in studio together. and We hadn't released anything for a while. So... We did, uh, yeah, we did it. We did a new song called Last December, actually, that just came out in last December. 
but no, I mean, we're just like not in a rush to get back on tour. Like obviously tours are getting canceled like crazy. I, mm-hmm. I still think touring is like, it's still early it's sort of on the fence thing. Like yeah. I'm, I'm like, none of us were in the rush. So like we got to get right back on tour the second it's a possibility. Just, I didn't want to go and have make some people feel uncomfortable. Like I kind of want to go, but I don't feel comfortable going to shows yet. Like I know the bands that are doing it, I get it. Hmm. Some people like, have to do it like crews really need work there's a lot of people who've been really out of work and really needing it and they like have to go on tour and they're doing it right now and they're doing what they need to do and i get it but like you know luckily we all have a bunch of other things going on in our life like job wise that we can stay focused on and stay Mm -hmm. busy and next year hopefully next year is going to be 20 years of young and hopeless so we have been talking a little bit about i know right which is crazy (laughs) but We've definitely been having those conversations of like, okay, it's 20 years next year. We got to do something special. So we're, we're definitely have been talking a little bit about what we could do. So um, nothing, nothing in stone, but I right. would like to think that we'll, we'll do some stuff next year. I know that um, Benji and Joel were getting into like streaming concerts from venues around, like they were trying to start something like that. Did you guys ever discuss doing a live stream concert or anything like that? Um, yeah, we did. Um, I mean, they did one, like just an acoustic thing Mm. by themselves. So, yeah. So like that, the Veeps company is, is like, they're they're actually part owners of that company. They started Veeps like crazy because they started it before there was a pandemic. They have no idea that the whole world would need these virtual concerts like that. And then the whole world just sort of fell apart and we're like, Hey, we've got this really great thing we've been developing. (laughs) So that just worked out really, really awesome for them um but yeah they did like an acoustic thing but honestly we were we were all just like really really like i don't i I hate to talk about masks and vaccines and all that stuff because it's such a a weird topic but we were all really smart about it like no we're not all going to get in a room together (laughs) we have to bring techs in we have to all be in a room together and we've all like at home with our families like keeping safe Mm. i was like we're just not going to do it because we don't have to like we just didn't right. want a chance there was no reason to so i mean benji and joel are twins they literally live right by each other they see each other like they spend a lot of time together. So even during the pandemic they were always together so like it made sense for the two of them to get together and do like an acoustic thing together but for throughout the whole like pandemic i saw each of them once that's it you know oh, wow. because yeah. like we just were like being really smart and staying home and just like not not going out so yeah so we didn't ever do any good charlotte live streaming purposefully because of that um mm. you know and now you know we could i guess now because everyone's vaccinated but then again i feel like everything's falling apart again on that yeah. <laughs> so uh, again <clears throat> it's just like we don't have to do it and i don't know that there's any rush to put anyone in danger just to do a stream i mean i feel bad because i know fans would love to do it but nah um yeah. i don't really think like we have to do it so we will, but yeah, no, no. Like when it's safe. Plans, yes. When it's safe 100%. And we can do it, no one has to stress. That's when we're going to do it. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, have you seen the pop punk music famous YouTube personalities are making now? Uh, I see this question. I'm not familiar with those names. Yeah. Um, I know the but, names, but I haven't heard any of any music come um, from so them. So, like, no. not a gatekeeper. If anyone wants to make something that I'm a part of, like, more famous and more popular, like, cool great right that's 100 a good thing for the scene like uh, i never will get mad if someone's like they're a poser making pop punk i'm like yeah but did like a thousand new 10 year olds maybe get into pop punk this week because 100%. they heard that and then they're gonna find out who were the cool pop punk bands before them like that's how it works like yes i'm yeah super into that well that was um, like I'm not mad about mgk no the record was awesome like mm. did i think it was gonna be good no i thought it was gonna suck and i was like oh <laughs> BMS, I listened to the record and I thought, damn, it's really good. Like every song was good. I mean, mm-hmm. sure, he's got Travis and John Feldman involved, who are like two of the best at it. Like, but the songs were really good and like it only made pop punk cool again. So I, I don't get why people get mad about it. I, I mean, I do get it, but there's just, I, I'm not like that. Right. I think it's just people hold things too close to the chest. Like, like that's got a lot to do with it. Yes, but like it's my special thing yes, and I don't want to share it. 100%. Um, okay i get that but you're not trying to make a living off of it like i am (laughs) you know like i'm okay when it gets big but that was a thing back in the day like in one of your songs um name drops social distortion and minor threat and bands like that and that alone probably sent tons and tons of fans their way just to check out oh i've never heard of that and 
that should be the way it is like yeah and all the minor threat fans were pissed about it but minor threat was probably like hey cool you know yeah. what i mean and that's how it always <laughs> works like the bands are like yeah of course we want new people to find out about our band and then you've got uh the dude from cannibal corpse lately has been complaining that one of the kardashians had a cannibal corpse shirt on it's like man just why i mean like music shirts in general have become more of a fashion statement than they have right. about personally i wouldn't wear a band shirt if i didn't like the band right um because i'm always like very like proud of when i wear a band band shirt for like a band i love like i'm doing it because i'm shouting out a band i love mm. but like if somebody sees a shirt and it's got this crazy like death metal artwork on it and a logo they can't even see and they're like yo that shirt is hard i love that and they want to rock it who cares yeah it's just close like who cares? <laughs> well that's like ghost ghost is probably my favorite band that's modern now like i love ghost like it's i think it's more of like this the presence of the stage show because i'm really sure. into like when i go see a band if they have like a massive stage set up it like it sticks more yeah. Because the first concert I ever saw was Kiss. So nice. that started like right at the top there. So like when a band has a an actual stage set up, I think it sticks with people more as opposed to like, yeah, we, we can stand up here and play the song, but we're not going to move around. We're just going to stand here and play. Like I, I get it, but I think bands need to have a stage show. Agree. And when everyone got mad at MGK for saying that, I was like, he was like, I'm sick of people going up there with like, their running shoes and they're right like put on some like chucks put on some boots like put on like yes and people are like oh rock and roll is not about how you dress and i'm like <laughs> you know yeah. <laughs> and it's, like, it's the whole package like you're you're an entertainer that's your job get yes. up there and put on a show like a thousand percent one of my favorite bands back in the day was helmet i don't know if you're familiar with helmet yeah. or not but helmet would like look like literally like the dads from school or something like Paige Hamilton <laughs> would get up on stage and like a plain white t-shirt and like cut off jean shorts and i'd be like ah like it was all and then they start playing i'm like i love the song so much but like there was always a disconnect from like how hard the records were and then you see the band get up there and i'm like oh there's there's no visuals you know and no no diss i mean Paige hamilton is one 100%. of my guitar hmm. heroes um i think but that was like one band i always point out when i'm thinking like okay i went to see helmet and i was like very underwhelmed by the show because there was like it was just like band practice and I happened to be there is what it felt like. Right, so, right, right. And then you go see, you know, someone like Nine Inch Nails back in the day and it's like, oh my God, you know, like just like the coolest thing you've ever seen. 100%. And I think that's like, especially nowadays, I think that's much needed because we live in an age where everything's visual now. Everything is like TikTok and YouTube, like... Oh, I'm you, nervous to go on tour again. I'm oh. thinking, man, you really got to bring it. You know, like the, even little baby bands that no one's heard of have visuals. Yes. Like it was crazy. It's expensive. Like <clears throat> when we toured back in the day, like very rarely did you have like all those visuals. And now it's like, it's a must. A hundred percent. Which is crazy. Oh, uh, let's see. Is there anybody else? Da, da, da. When do you think you'll end up touring again? Whenever all of this stuff does, <laughs> ends, I would yeah. imagine. I really hope next year. That would be, but yeah, you so definitely don't have anything booked. Just, you know, right. That's waiting out the storm. And all of these bands that have been touring, it seems like they're all catching it. That too. I know like 10 people who are vaccinated who've gotten it. I had it and that's another, a couple weeks yeah. back. It, it, it sucked. <laughs> it was terrible, <laughs> but uh, um, it is. It's like, I can just think right off the top of my head, Corey Taylor, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley, uh, like there's, there's just Jonathan a ton. Davis. Yeah. Jonathan, yeah, Davis. he had to Davis. sit in a chair for right. most of their shows. Like that's crazy. Yeah. After it was gone, he was so like worn out from, you know, Limp Bizkit canceled their tour too. It's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. But I mean, like, like you were saying, I get it. They're broke. Some well, not, maybe not them, but like a lot of the smaller bands are like, they have to do it for money. Cause like you know, what some people don't understand too, is like a band who's like not broke and really successful. Like, they're like that because they tour all the time. Right. <laughs> like they live in nice houses and live in nice cars and like are not broke because they go on tour. You take away the touring and like the money starts to go fast. You right. know? So people will be like, I don't understand why like, you know, all these huge arena bands have to go on tour. I was like, yeah, because their mortgage payment and their insurance <laughs> and the, like the, the crews that they pay, like they are paying a ton of money every month. And if they don't go on tour, that money goes away. You know? Yeah, so like, sure. Just like, 
I think people just don't like understand sometimes like you don't like get rich once and stay rich forever. Like right. you have to keep working, you know, and some of those bands, like when the touring ends, they think, holy crap, like uh, that's a, a lot of money that I have to come up with. So like, yeah, like people have to get back on tour. And it's a it, band. It's really, really hard to make money just off the music alone nowadays. Super hard. So like touring and merch sales are like huge, like, huge. That's app. like 80% of for most bands. Right. Uh, let's see. Why do you think Warp Tour ended? Um, hmm. Who knows? I think it's a lot of work to do the Warp Tour. <laughs> um, yeah, like <sighs> it's a lot of work. I think you know, Kevin Lyman probably got to a point in his age where he was like, "Man, is it a lot of work to do the Warp Tour? Like, maybe just not." Because um, I still think it did okay. People showed up, but mm-hmm. um, at some point, it's more about you're keeping the Warp Tour alive because you feel like you have to, and not because you want to. And um, right. I, th- I think it was probably just time, but anyone could come up with any kind of traveling summer tour and call it something different. And you essentially like kind of have the warp tour again. Right. Like, right. I think uh, it was, I'm I th- sure we will get that back in some right. form. I think a lot of it was like, they had the same bands there every single year over and over. And it was like, you know, we've seen this show before, like warp yeah. tour was about bringing in new bands and then it just became about the same bands. And it's like, you know, yes. Yes, That's... it was fun. I mean, I, I attribute Warp Tour to a lot of our success. It was super fun. Hmm. But at 40, would I ever want to do the whole Warp Tour again? <laughs> oh, boy. Those, yeah. I, I've heard horror stories about backstage at Warp Tour. Ugh. It's just dirty. You know, yeah. it's just dirty. Sometimes you're playing in like Arizona and there's like a dust storm one day and Ooh, you're just God. like chewing on dirt like all day because <laughs> it's like you're just outside. It's like 110 and there's a dust storm and then. And like the shower, there's like five showers for like 700 people to share. And you're like, gosh. like, I'm Ugh. not using that. You know? It's, <laughs> you know, it's it's fun when you're like 20, but like at some point I'm like, no, we, and, and we would pop on and do like three or four days or like a week, hmm. like as we got older, like, cause we wanted to do it, but like two months straight of every day, I was like, no way, but I miss, miss the experience. So yeah, it was fun to kind of hop, pop on and pop off for a little bit. What was the main difference with the music industry when you first started versus now? The internet? The internet, <laughs> yeah. Uh, actual record sales. Um, MTV being the only place to see videos. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that, that kind of stuff was big. I always say there's pros and cons. Like, before there was, like, less bands that could get reached a level of success. So, like, the competition was less because you kind of had to be on a major label. You really kind of had to do it that way to, like, be at the top of the game. Mm. to like be on MTV and like stuff like that. But, and and nowadays it's like, I think anyone who has like access to the internet and like the possibility to record their own music has the same like level of chance of having a song hit. So now the competition is way, way, way steeper, but it's easier to get into the industry. Right. So that's sort of like a catch 22, I think. So I, I love like both. Right. It was really cool back in the day when like, record labels would like pay for us to like take first class flights and like give us a million dollars to do a video and like crazy like you know stuff that Mm. labels would do but i also love it that like i don't know you know like we could do something like this you reach out to me on twitter and say hey let's have a conversation for my podcast like before that you would have had to like write a letter or email yeah. the man oh man ask, Can I possibly schedule? and they'd be like what's a podcast you mean like on your radio station do you have a radio channel like where do you broadcast like no i don't have a radio channel like it's just literally like 10 years difference like that's how you would have right. had to do it 10 years ago and like now like you just hit me up saying like here's a video of something i did with Wes. would you want to do this i'm like yeah sure cool like it took 30 seconds right you know? so there's a lot of pros and cons of of the industry changing for right. sure like do we make money off record sales anymore no <laughs> But uh, can can a lot of young people get into music easier? Yeah, and that's a good thing. Do you think record labels are necessary in this day and age? Um, like to some extent, like like kind of when we were talking about the whole like big stage production and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Like I like cool videos. Like I'm so tired of seeing like the same like iPhone video of like a filter and it's all glitching. The guy's like doing stuff and like the lights are flat. I'm like, Oh God, like I've seen this video so many times, but it's like, Oh my bro is like so sick with the editing. I'm like, yeah, you and every other bro with an iPhone. Like, <laughs> I, like I, I miss big videos where there was mm-hmm. like 
big HD shots and like cool lighting and like, but, but that's expensive. So like for right. me, I feel like record labels help the band to present themselves in a way that you couldn't do out of pocket. So yes, do you need a label? No. If you want to do like DIY album video tour, you could do it all yourself and you could make some decent money these days right. and do like a pretty good job. But if you want to be like, I don't know, all time low or 21 pilots or like the bands in the alternative rock scene who are like at the top of the game, like selling millions of records right, and selling at arenas kind of think you need a label to like push that. Right. So it all depends what kind of artist you want to be, especially with like arena shows, because you got to have all that like insurance for the, and all of that stuff. That's just there's like a lot. Yeah. There's a lot that people don't think about that goes into that. So, you know, labels, labels help with that. The crazy thing about 21 Pilots is they're actually from Ohio. I oh, okay. I actually saw 21 Pilots play in front of six people nice. back in the day when they first started, and now they're selling out, like, basketball stadium, like, arenas, yeah. like, 40,000 yeah, people. Yeah. It's absolutely insane to see stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, somebody had said, I don't remember who said it, but they said that, like, when you sign a record contract, you're basically just getting a loan because you have to pay for insurance on the tour insurance on the people on tour. Then you have to pay for like merch insurance and like CD insurance. And it's like all this other stuff. Like you sign a million dollar deal, but you don't have a million dollars in your pocket. Basically. So, I mean, you, you do, but then you don't ever see any money from your record sales. Right. So it's sort of like, we'll give you a million dollars and you can put it in the bank and you can do whatever you want with it. But then like, even if you sell a million records, like you still don't get any more money until you, until you like pay us that million dollars back. Right. You know what I mean? So it's sort of like you could choose to take that million dollars. You could choose to take half of it. You could choose to take 500,000 and then you only have to pay 500,000 back. You could choose to take none of it and then start making money from your record sales right away. But it might take a long time to get. So usually right. you take that loan because like you said, you need to like, like we got a, you know, we got our advance and we bought a van to go on tour. Mm. Like, let's buy a van. Let's buy better equipment. We have to buy cases. So all of our equipment can, can stay safe, mm. you know, stay safe. And like, we put all that money into like, what can we like use to like, so that we could successfully go on tour. Like we didn't like all buy houses and cars, which like some people do. And right, then, right, right, right. Like, well, shit, now I got to go on tour and all I have is a house and a car and that's not going to work. You know, like, how do I pay for this stuff on tour? So you definitely got to be smart. And then, yes, you hope that your record sells a lot into the point where you're like the label's like, hey, you know, we made one point five million dollars on record sales this week. So now we're even on that one million you took. And then from this point on, you know, we, we are splitting everything mm. that comes through. But yeah, and, you know, until you pay that loan back, you don't make anything from your right. record sales. Let's see. Do you feel like you were the last wave of bands that made a shitload of money off of CDs and things? Probably. It's, that seems about. I mean, about two thousand four, two thousand five is when, uh, like LimeWire like and stuff Aaron started. Moore, Panic at the Disco, Fall Out Boy, My Cam. That may have been that. That scene was right after us. You know, that was like. Right. I always think of like we were pop punk, and that was emo. You know, so mm. I do think there was probably some. You know, Lincoln Park too came like oh, right yeah. around the same time as us. They sold a lot of records, so I would think yeah, like us or that next wave after us, and then from that point on, it was all streaming. Yeah, I feel like because I know the Black Parade when that came out, that album was absolutely massive. Massive, I, yeah. Let's see. I'd love to hear a whole podcast about the music industry changing since the beginning of your career versus now. I mean, wow. I feel like that. I feel like that's a conversation that could be literally just talked about for hours. Yeah, I mean, everyone has a different sort of view on it too. How how they were affected by it. I'm sure there's podcasts about that. Yeah, there's. There's a lot of stuff on the internet right now. That's, that is the thing that's great. The, one of the positives about the internet is everything is so easily accessible now. Like if you want to learn about something, you literally just go on YouTube and type in whatever it is and you can find thousands oh, of learned, videos. Yeah, that's how I learned how to be a producer. Like I was like, I don't know how to mix. I don't know how to engineer. Like I've always had a producer in the studio doing that for us when we were doing good Charlotte records. And I was hmm thinking i could learn i've learned everything just on youtube and now like i feel like i, I could i'm very comfortable in a studio without ever actually like going and sitting with someone to teach me it's crazy internet's awesome would you want to produce a good charlotte album or would you rather have someone else in there uh like maybe just like 
a second ear is always nice. You know, right. like that's the cool thing about the producer is, is, is that, but like, um, it would, it would be fun. Maybe just doing a song just to see what it would sound like if I were to do a good Charlotte song. But right. I also know that like, you know, we've done records with like Eric Valentine, Don Gilmore, John Feldman and Zach Servini. Like those are like four of like the biggest names in like all of rock production in the last like 20 years. And I'm thinking like, how lucky I was to work with those like legends and like soak up and still when I'm writing and producing stuff now, I think, Oh, what would one of those guys have done in this case? Like what, how would have they, you know, approach this song and, and, and you can't pay for it. that. You can't be on, but fine on YouTube. You cannot sit in the room with one of like, you know, the guy who did hybrid theory for Lincoln park, you know, or like the producer who did, Smash Mouth or Third Eye Blinds, like big, re- like, you know, big, big, big records that, you know, like I got to sit in the room multiple times and make albums with those guys and soak up their technique. So that's a kind of a, a priceless thing. So, so yeah, I would say if we did another record, it's usually a cool opportunity to work with someone like that right. and, and see what I could learn from. All right. Well, let's see. Yeah. Um, I think we're good there. It's been about an hour and a half. All right. Well, uh, a lot of good stuff, man. Hopefully, yeah, that I appreciate was, uh, it. Yeah, good like, for you, and oh I gosh. enjoy talking music. It's always fun. I one hundred percent appreciate it. Like I said, like you were in one of the three bands that inspired me throughout my entire teenage years, and it's just like it's absolutely crazy to sit here and have a conversation with you like this because it's like you personally influenced me in so many ways. Like I've got Nightmare Before Christmas, and all that stuff was just like deeply ingrained into me when i hit like 14 years old so i appreciate you doing this hey i appreciate crazy to me you know because i'm still a fan i still am like a fan of like if i went in a room with like you know corn or something like that i'm nervous you know what i mean i'm still like nervous you know i'm not like oh we're the same i'm like no 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 (laughs) that's like so like it's crazy to think that people feel that way about my band and it's hard to ever see yourself from the outside when you're on the inside you can never see it like somebody else sees it but, uh, you know, I always appreciate hearing stories like that because I know what it would mean to me and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, man, thank you for just supporting us over the years. And oh yeah, I hope everybody keeps, you know, anyone new who's watching right now who maybe came from my Twitch stream to make sure you guys are following the the captain here and checking out what he's doing. And anyone new from this who hasn't seen mine, um, check out my Twitch and maybe one day I'll get back to it. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I appreciate it. For sure, man. Thank you. Yep. Thanks.